Uh, you ready? Yeah, I'm always ready. Excellent. Good morning, and welcome to Monday Morning Gasoline. I'm Mikkel, and with me today I have, uh, I mean, I don't know if I can use any other word other than badass, Cody, but I have Cody Falcon. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, so, full disclosure, Cody and I uh, used to work together at a previous startup, and actually Cody was my boss for a couple months, and uh, we had a great time, and now that company, that uh, you know, the project that we were working on, Cody is uh, leading the company that I guess was uh, spun off, so, and I brought you on to, uh, to learn more about that and to talk about fun security things. Cody, how are you? Oh doing? yeah, I'm good, man. I'm, uh, you know, it's Monday morning. The this thing is uh, appropriately titled Monday Morning Gasoline. I'm, it's six thirty a.m. in Houston. We're up early, ready to rock, ready to crush the week. I feel great. Thanks for having me on, by the way. Looking forward to uh, just talking shop and uh, maybe nerding out a little bit when it comes to security and technology. Excellent. Yeah. I I got you. Got, I saw you had coffee earlier. I got my energy drink. It's it's a good morning. Oh good man, morning. energy drinks early instead of coffee. That, that's hardcore, Miguel. <laughs> I yeah, you know, I'm not showing the the brand though because they're not paying. But you know. yeah, yeah, you can't plug them. Yeah, that's right. No, no. Okay, it's bang. It's delicious, and I I drink them <laughs> every morning. Is there, is there a certain flavor you're after or just? Yeah, the Miami Cola, uh, but okay. not everyone carries it. So I have to settle for this uh, candy apple crisp, which is like uh, spiked apple juice, but without the alcohol. <laughs> okay. Okay. So just to get into it, um, the company I just mentioned earlier is Data Seer, and you guys do some really cool stuff with data. So uh, can you kind of uh, do like a little preview yeah. of Data Seer? Yeah, so, you know, the, uh, the company that Mikkel and I worked at together, uh, we were focused in kind of big data analytics, right? Um, heavy streaming data and really focused in kind of the industrial space, right? So you think about um, oil and gas or maybe a refinery, right? There's a lot of data being generated. How do you use that data um, to optimize the plant, the process, get more output, et cetera, and do it more safely than what you're doing today. Um, and so in that we were building um, a lot of different apps, right? A lot of different applications, a lot of different um, use cases, solving a lot of different problems. Well, one of the problems that uh, we went after was uh, trying to um, extract all of the information from diagrams right? Um, engineering diagrams, think schematics, blueprints, in oil and gas, they call them piping and instrumentation diagrams, but it literally, I mean, it looks like a schematic. And a lot of times these are in PDF format or they were done in CAD in the early nineties and they've been scanned in multiple times. And there's no easy way to get all of that information out of those diagrams to do something meaningful. And when I talk about doing something meaningful, um, a lot of times people talk about creating quote unquote digital twins, right? Which is a digital representation of a physical asset. So if you're thinking about a refinery or a, a process plant, for example, you know, you may have seen the commercials from GE and others during the Super Bowl that people are wearing HoloLens and they're navigating this 3D asset and pushing on things and is giving them valve readings. Well. How you get to those, ultimately, you start at the diagram or the schematic level, right? That's the ground truth of how this thing is constructed or built. And so we built the product that we now call Data Seer today, which allows you to upload all of those diagrams into Data Seer. Um, and Data Seer will use all of your advanced, you know, your AI, your ML, your deep nets, and extract all of the information off of it recognize everything on that diagram, label everything for you, and then give it back to you uh, in just minutes, right? So that's that's the product that uh, I'm leading today. And uh, that's the company actually. So we spun out um, of our parent company and it's kind of fun, right? One of our flagship leading products, we saw a lot of market traction, we saw the product fit and 
decided to spin that out and create its own company out of a software product. And so that's what I'm working on today and having a blast doing so. So you're digitizing these documents and then I guess people can take those, that data, and then they'll know like how many of widget X they have, how many, you know, oh, yeah. of pipe Y and they can use that for all sorts of things like maintenance and stuff. But yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, a good example. I mean, that's a, that's a good example, Miguel. So imagine you have, uh, let's say you have a, a refinery or some asset somewhere, a factory, right. And it was built 40 or 50 years ago. And you have all of the blueprints and the schematics that lay out the process. And it's all in AutoCAD style diagrams, right? These big paper diagrams, and maybe they've been scanned in. Maybe you have a somewhat of a digital copy. Um, well, you know, if someone asks you, hey, we need to recreate this factory, um, how many how many feet of pipe, how many globe valves do I have here, right? Or, hey, I'm having an issue with this particular valve. What is upstream and downstream of that valve? Well, in your old school process, right, some engineer is going to go back to the file room and, you know, find that particular schematic and manually trace it or highlight it, right, where something like Datasir comes along and you can throw your throw the diagram at it and say you know ask it questions how many how many how many feet of pipe do i have how many of these globe valves that are three inch are in this refinery right and it will scan thousands and thousands of documents and give you an answer you know right away so you know i guess that is here you know is focused on the product whereas arundo mm -hmm. the company we worked for did not just product we had several products as well as the services side right you know, that's right how dip how different is it you know working on data steer than it was you know being the CISO, you know and trying to yeah i guess uh manage the data in multiple projects where you know we were doing uh we had more people we were doing crazy oh, yeah. different things and so is it yeah is it still similar you know i think no, I think it's I think it's actually pretty similar, right? Because um, in the world that we work, right? I mean, in and I'm talking about you know, heavy industry, so your big global conglomerates and um, that make gasoline, for example, right? Like these these major players that uh, make and produce energy and then distribute energy, right? They they often treat their data, and this is kind of crazy to think about, but they treat that operational data just as sensitive, if not more so than the, what you and I would consider, you know, sensitive data, things like personally identifiable information, right? And when you talk to a, an industrial or an operational CISO, for example, and you ask them, hey, what's, uh, what's more damaging and critical to the business? Losing the recipe for Coca-Cola or losing Mikkel's home address and, and social security number or telephone number, right? And I think you know what the answer is going to be, unfortunately. Yeah, definitely Coca-Cola. Right? Yeah, yeah. I think my and so what they're going to do, right? Everywhere. Like they, exactly. So they, what they do is they try, and, and not try, they do, right? You'll see um, in that world, right, these CISOs will apply classic PII safeguard techniques and compliance, things like GDPR, et cetera, onto operational data, which – you know, legally, that's not what it's for, but from a protection standpoint, that's probably the highest standard that you can follow, right? If you protect your operational data just as much, if not more so, than you protect all of your employees' home addresses and social security numbers, you know, if you can group it all under the same umbrella, um, that's probably a good way to, to practice. And so that's what we see, right? Even at companies with very targeted niche products like Datasphere, in these industrial companies, the, the data the data seer analyzes, right, is highly sensitive in a very competitive market. So that kind of brings me to my next question. So you are the only person that I've seen, uh, you know, while I was there at Arundo, pass the ISO 27001 oh, yeah. certification. Um, yeah. So, you know, I had a, uh, another guest, Michael, on a few weeks ago, and, mm -hmm. you know, he's going through a different audit. I think high trust was mm -hmm. the one that he was going through, mm -hmm. but you know, mm -hmm. he bemoaned the, the, I guess 
checkbox type nature of these of that audit yeah. you know whereas you know you need to do this you need to do that you know, oh yeah how has your experience been you know trying to get the audit for Arun doing like working on you know the data security side do you think the the audit drove a lot of the security or do you think it was easier because the security was already implemented or yeah. no i think it's somewhere in between i mean look i think anyone that works in auditing and compliance could probably relate uh to michael's pains right a lot of times you do feel like it's you're you're driving a chat box <clears throat> but if you're just trying to get it done that's great right i mean check boxes are easy to check right if you have a checklist just crank down the list it seems a little silly but at the end of the day you get what you're after which may be this certification um i think when i when i think about iso and SOC and hipaa high trust any of these compliance audits and certification programs i think first and foremost right is to understand like why you're doing it right what why you need to or you want to pursue this audit or certification and then most importantly, recognize the commitment required. These things aren't easy, right? I mean, these things mm -hmm. sometimes take year, year plus, two years. Um, ISO is a three-year audit cycle, right? And they're always on you. And when I say they're always on you, you always have an audit or auditors coming on board, right, to review things. Yeah. And so, you know, think about like, hey, is this marketing or sales related, right? Is this going to help me drive business? Are my customers requiring it? Recognize that all of these things are really expensive, right, to go do both in time and personnel. Um, and I think the the best way to do it, right, is just to kind of stay organized. Well, well I always tell my teams, right, is you, you stay organized when it comes to security and compliance and then continuously improve month to month, right? You never want to be in a situation where you're, quote, unquote, preparing for an audit, right? Like if you're on top of your stuff, there's no, pre I'm always ready for an audit. There's no preparation, right? So you see a lot of firms, they'll go nine months and everything is normal. And then they'll spend, you know, two months in absolute panic mode, figuring things out and building a, build, trying to build a whole program in 60 days, right? That's not going to fly. So you never want to be in kind of audit prep, just continuously improve it. And why I, why I like ISO is it's risk-based, right? I mean, it's a risk-based framework, right? So you know, when you think about it, everyone, every company um, has weaknesses that can be exploited. So if you could address just one of those weaknesses this quarter or this month, which one would it be, right? Which one is most likely to be exploited, right? And hurt your company. And that's how ISO kind of drives their, their process, right? You don't have to check the box and fill out everything. It's like, hey, I've done a risk assessment. We have 400 different things that are broken or weak or that could be fixed or improved upon. Okay. Which one are we going to tackle this month or this quarter? Right. And then you score all of those risks based on impact to the company. Um, so that's the ISO story. I mean, we, <clears throat> we did it. Um, we did it within a year. It probably took us six months or so. Um, you know, and it's a stance it's a ISO 27,001, for example, is a three year program. So you, your first year is your kind of, I almost think about it as like a pre-check, right? That's your certification audit in year two and three. Those are what we call surveillance audits. So some auditors will come and make themselves at home <clears throat> with you for uh, a couple of weeks a year and just go through everything to see um, how you're doing, right? How you're continuously improving. And not that you have to have everything fixed, but have you made progress? So how do you like keep your team focused on that? Well, I mean, there are always these production deliverables, right, that have to be done. Oh, yeah. And you know, at a startup, I think that you know, that's sometimes even more uh, pertinent, right? So, oh, how yeah. do you keep the staff focused on that? You know, or like, is there? Do you talk about it, or is it like a time yeah. a week, or is it? You know... Yeah, I mean, I, I think that. <laughs> And this is much easier said than done, Michael, but I think it's, you just, you just make it part of the process, right? I mean, that's, it's really hard to do. It's easy to talk about. It's hard to implement, but it should just be kind of baked into the fabric of what you're doing, right? Uh, and when I think about security or OPSEC or anything like that, it's, it's, it's not a, 
it's not a one time, you know, dedicated kind of discipline. It's baked into the fact, like it's in the organization. We're always talking about it, right? We're I was leading you there. I'm sorry about cycles, that. You what? I was so le- I was leading you there. I'm sorry about that. I, if if no, that was fine. a little transparent, but yeah, yeah. You know, I, I think. I think that's crucial. And, you know, I think that's what allowed, you know, the audit to be successful. And for, you know, when I first got there, everything was segmented, you know, security was already being, you know, considered. And uh, I think, yeah, it, it wasn't something that I saw at every place, you know, before that. Right. Right. So I wonder if we hadn't done that originally, or if whoever, you know, if, if the team that was previously there hadn't done that, if we would have had a much harder time, you know, completing. And like you said, right, you don't want to just, uh, you know, oh, I have an audit, let's focus on this now and then forget right. about it for six months or a year. Right. Yeah. And, you know, that's, you know, I talk about ISO a lot, but that's, that's one of the benefits of a risk based kind of methodology or approach like ISO, right? Like, we know that you have tons of flaws and holes, right? And it's not a checkbox exercise to just try to put a bandaid on 400 things. It's like, hey, we really spent the time and we looked at all 400. These two had the highest risk to our company, right? Like reward is there if someone wants to exploit and they're fairly likely to be exploited. And so those are the two that we went after. These other 398 can wait, right? And as long as you're kind of making progress through those, it's fine. Um, so yeah, that's what we did. And, you know, taking it back to OPSEC, right? We, we always talk about it. You're in the world that I come from, right? You're, I can tell you that humans are um, always the weakest link in the chain and the easiest to exploit, right? I mean, we, we've seen it time and time again, whether you want to talk about nation state sponsored things like solar winds, all the way down to, you know, your local bank being ransomed, right? It's, it, it's always, well, not always, most of the time it's people, right? Regardless of the technology and all the nerdy things that we can talk about and all the things that you try to prevent, uh, your newest employee sitting on that service desk, um, if I can call and start a conversation and trick him or her into giving me a little bit to footprint and then do the same thing the next day, right? Humans. Humans are always the weakest, so training, bringing it up in conversations, bringing it up in sprint planning, bringing it up in reviews, retros, retrospect, all of this, right? Like, keep it top of mind where people subconsciously are aware of the security position and, um, you know, makes it a little bit harder to exploit them. Well, so let's talk about solar winds, But, and, I mean, to your point, you know, because that, any employee on the network or any employee that, you know, eventually someone is going to get in, right? That's, that, yeah. you know, that's the truth for uh, Equifax mm-hmm. and with solar winds, that's the truth for like 20,000 or something like that customers. It's some ridiculous <laughs> amount. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So yeah. what do you do afterwards? Like, what is a good way of, you know, so this happened, I mean, do you go out and announce it publicly right away or do you like, so uh, I guess I should tell the viewers uh, in your previous experience, you were in Navy intelligence and uh, you also worked at the white house and that's the intelligence. (laughs) Yeah. So, so yeah. So my, uh, my experience there, right. I mean, I've spent more than, than half of my adult life um, in the, in and around the intelligence services, right. Um, In the U S right. All on the cyber, um, side of intelligence, offensive and defensive. Um, and so I, uh, you know, what do you do when something like that? I, I think number one is you, you have to have the capability to realize and recognize when you have been breached, right? There's nothing more embarrassing yeah. than, I mean, solar winds is a great example, right? I mean, at nine the months, very yeah. macro level. Yeah, it's like, oh, well, you didn't know we've been here for nine months, right? Thanks for, thanks for everything. Right? And it's like, oh, man, that's a that's a big sword to fall on. Right. Because now for compliance reasons, right, you have to notify your customers within a certain SLA, yada, yada. Right. And it's not only do you have to notify them, hey, I was just breached, but I was breached nine months ago and they've been surveilling us for the last nine months. Right. That's that's really bad. Um, so you have to be able to 
you need the sensors, the personnel, the processes, et cetera. Um, you, you have to be able to recognize when you've been breached, number one. You do need the kind of processes to, to notify and kind of contain and shut things down. And then, you know, talking about solar winds and bringing it back to OPSEC and personnel, right? I, I think it's, um, it's ongoing training, right? You, you're not going to be able to get away from technological advances and exploits, right? Especially if they're, if they're state sponsored attacks, right? Like you're not, um, whether it's talking about, um, you know, FSB or the CIA, right? Like if, if something like that, a state sponsored organization wants what you have when it comes to data, uh, trust me, I'm here to tell you that they're gonna get it. <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't matter. There is no technology that you can prevent something like that, right? All you can do is arm your people um, to be a little bit more aware and hopefully try to extend that or offer up enough of a defense where they move to the next target. So how, how I guess, how effective do you think uh, solutions where the data is just not shared, like air gap solutions are uh, for securing data, even against like state actor type scenarios you know is air gapping yeah. you know is it effective is it have you had experience yeah. with it or... yeah look i think it's um i mean my my take on this i think air gapping is um a bit old school right i mean we see it in the industrial space right people oh you know we 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 don't, you know, all USB ports are blocked and we snail mail things and we'll mail you a CD or, you know, things are literally backed up to an external drive and then we go put it in a safety deposit box, right? I mean, this feels like the mid nineties to me, right? I mean, it, and, and I think back to something like solar winds or state sponsored attacks, that does not matter if I really want the information. Right. I mean, we, we see it, right? Like how did solar winds happen? I mean, you may have seen it on Friday, right? The U S has now slapped a ton of sanctions on Russia and then all of these quote unquote contributing companies, which is unfortunate because these sanctions and, you know, the U S throwing all these company names on here are probably going to crush these companies. Um, but you know, that, that wasn't necessarily a technology thing. Right. That was folks coming in, corporate espionage, coming in, starting to work for the company and doing bad things. Right. It, again, back to people um, being the easiest mechanism. Um, anyway, that's that's how I think about it. And, and air gaps. I, yeah, it, I guess they work to some extent, uh, depending on the sensitivity of the data. Uh, but the reality is, if someone really wants that data, air gap doesn't really matter anyway. And I think we start talking about air gaps, getting into that trade-off discussion of security and usability becomes a real thing, right? I mean, how can you air gap things in today's working world where the um, expectation is instantaneous data, SaaS, cloud, elasticity, everything's there. I mean, you're going to slow things down big time when it comes to operations and just being able to get stuff done if, <laughs> if you're truly trying to trying to air gap things right i mean yeah that's my that's my take yeah i guess it'd have to be a real high value in order for that trade-off to be worth it because you do basically go back to like the pre-internet days of you know the yeah. 80s in terms of oh, yeah. the ability to transfer data yeah and we oh. see it right i mean just from a business and like sales perspective right i see it you know a couple times a month some some big company right is so They've recently been breached or they think that their data is so sensitive, right? That they can't, I mean, unfortunately they can't compete with other companies that are more technologically forward thinking and not air gapping things, right? Because there's, there may be solutions out there that would help their business tremendously, right? Whether it's something like data or any other kind of product, right? And like, oh, well, we can't do that because it runs in the cloud. Okay, well, guess what? All of your competitors are using you name the cloud software and they're crushing you and they're continuing to gain ground on you. But if you want to um, stay locked down and everything on premise and air gapped, I mean, you're going to be stuck in late 90s uh, software and processes, right? Yes, it's a competitive disadvantage at that point. Yeah. 
So we have uh, about five more minutes left. Cody, thank you. Um, I have yeah. something that I do with every guest, and it's, I, you know, since we are Monday Morning Gasoline, and the goal is to motivate people to get their week started and do cool stuff. Um, do you have any words of wisdom for us? or? Uh, uh, sh- yeah. Yeah. Look, I, I think uh, when, I th- when I think about, like, motivation, and of course, right, I mean, we can talk we can nerd out on books and things that I would recommend and podcasts. But I think at the end of the day, for me personally, it's about not getting comfortable. Right. Um, and not that everyone is like this, but when I get comfortable, I get nervous. Right. And comfortable in your, your job, right. Your finances, your fitness, um, your technology knowledge, right. Like (laughs) when you get into this trap of, Oh, I'm comfortable, right? Everything's great, right? I can get lazy and you slack off, right? You become lackadaisical. You, um, thinking back to OPSEC, right? There's guys and gals right behind you, right? That are, uh, that are coming, right? And you can take that into, you know, if you're talking about the job search, right? One thing that I always talk to people about is staying what I call imminently employable, right? If you lost your job today, how attractive are you to any other company, right? And it can happen, right? We see it happen all the time. So things like staying well-read, staying knowledgeable on the latest trends in your discipline or your domain, right? Staying certified, right? If there are certifications you can go get, whether you're talking about IT or project management or even education, things like grad school, et cetera, Right. How do you continue to educate yourself and continue to get better and continue to train and stay, quote unquote, imminently employable? Right. And uh, yeah, for me, it all goes back to, you know, not not getting comfortable and and staying on top of it. Right. You don't want to get in this in this rut, because if you do, um, there are companies, there are people right alongside you or maybe right behind you that are going to gain. So um, just stay on top of it. And if you feel that comfortable feeling coming on, uh, I, I start to get nervous. Um, and so, yeah, that's my, <clears throat> that's my plug and, you know, books, we can talk about that, right. I'm a military guy. So I, I prefer the, uh, the hardcore approach and, uh, <clears throat> folks like Jocko Willink or David Goggins, right. Both, um, just <laughs> men of men and, uh, yeah, they uh, they have podcasts and uh, and books you can go listen to or read that will give you a kick in the butt and right and get you off of the couch and uh, make you want to go do things um, and put in the hard work to to achieve something. It's not for everyone. Uh, I'll warn you, right? I'm not saying that everyone is to be up at four thirty every morning running twenty miles, um, but those two guys will make you feel. <clears throat> <laughs> like a scrub, right? And, and kind of give you a kick to, to, to go do something and put the work in. And I've, so I've listened to earlier this year, I listened to Extreme Ownership, and it might have been on your recommendation. Uh, okay. And so I can't wait to listen to uh, David Goggins. Uh, he's got a lot of people yeah. out there. Yeah, I mean, Goggins, he's, uh, he's, he's hardcore, man. And if you're going to, if you're going to read or uh, it, the name of the book is Can't Hurt Me, right? And so if you haven't listened to it or read it, I would recommend listening to it because the audio book is done similar to this. It's similar to like a podcast interview back and forth, right? Someone reads the chapter and then Goggins is there and they bounce conversation back and forth. It's it's really good. Well, that's perfect because I consume most of my books through audio. So <laughs> There you go. It's a good one. Well, Cody, thank you so much for joining me today on this Monday morning. I hope you have an awesome Absolutely. week. Absolutely. My pleasure. All right. Thanks, everyone. See you guys. Have, a, have an awesome week. Bye bye.